Hi all, welcome to the National AAPI Community Call on Immigration. This is Megan Essahab with Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC. Um, I think um, Representative Chu is um, on and probably needs to go to votes pretty quickly, so I'm gonna quickly hand it over to her. Representative Chu, can you um, hear us? Yes. Okay, uh, great. Thank you. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you, AHAC, for inviting me and Congressmember Pramila Jayapal for today's critical AAPI immigration call. As chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, um, I want to transmit to you a sense of urgency. Um, for one thing, we need to make sure that we pass a Clean Dream Act, but we also need to make sure that in Trump's State of the Union speech that uh, he does not uh, destroy our family unification system. And tonight, he will try to institutionalize uh, his point of view that legal immigrants are the enemy and deserve to be um, blocked from coming to this country. Um, now, I have two, two missions on this call. One is to tell you about the urgency of our dreamers, and I have uh, tried to make sure here on Capitol Hill that people know that Asian Pacific Islanders are dreamers too, and that's why I'm bringing an AAPI dreamer, Jung Bin Cho, as my guest tonight. Tonight's State of the Union. We want to make sure that Donald Trump looks at the faces of the lives that he has upended due to his cruel decision to terminate the DACA program. And we also want to make sure that of the 800,000 young people who fear this deportation to a country that they do not know, that they do include Asian uh, so Pacific Islanders. Um, 130,000 uh, dreamers are Asian Pacific Islander. And of those who receive DACA, uh, 7,000 dreamers are from South Korea. Uh, nearly 5,000 are from the Philippines, over 3,000 are from India, nearly 2,000 are from Pakistan, and there are thousands more from throughout the Asia-Pacific region. So we in KPAC made it abundantly clear that we must pass a Clean Dream Act immediately to ensure that dreamers like Jung Bing can continue to contribute to the only country that he can call home. KPAC has made it clear, however, that such a solution should not be done on the back of our family-based immigration system. We should not pit immigrant communities against each other. We should not pit dreamers against our family-based immigration system. We should not trade one family's pain for another. And that's why we in the Congressional Asian Pacific Caucus absolutely opposed Donald Trump's racist White House immigration proposal to decimate and destroy legal immigration to this country. Now, for months, Donald Trump and his Republican allies have laid the groundwork, uh, vilifying our legal family immigration system by calling it an offensive term, chain migration. And that is to bring up the stereotype that hordes of people are coming uh, over the border into this country on the airplanes um, and uh, that somehow they are destroying this country. So his extreme proposal slams the door on immigration to this country to an extent that we have not seen in decades. Under his proposal, U.S. citizens and green card holders would no longer be able to sponsor their parents, nor, nor would they be able to sponsor siblings or adult children over the age of 21. Only spouses and minor children would be able to come, and this would cut in half the number of le legal immigrants who come to this country. Now, um, remember that it was in 1965 that the U.S. established a family-based immigration system allowing family members to petition for this, their relatives. This system corrected the restrictive law of previous decades um, through the National Origin Law of 1924, which mainly allowed Nordic Europeans 
into the country. It restricted Italians and Jews, and it completely banned Asians from coming to the country. We cannot return to those dark days. Trump has shown through his policy, though, that he wants to make America white again. It is really cruel to pit family-based immigration against dreamers. Doing so does not reflect their values as a nation, the nation represented by the Statue of Liberty. And remember that 80% of the Asian American immigrants who are here came through this 1965 law. KPAC has taken a strong stance that we do not want to see any cuts to the family immigration system included in a DACA deal. And if, if there's any such change, it must be part of a larger comprehensive immigration reform discussion and should not be used as a bargaining chip to hold dreamers hostage. Now, let me say that there have been bipartisan discussions in both the House and the Senate that have led to concrete legislative proposals to protect dreamers. It is deceptive for Donald Trump to say that Democrats are not working in good faith to find an immediate bipartisan solution to enshrine DACA protections. That is simply not true. And in fact, I'm a co-sponsor of the Heard Aguilar bill, which has 26 Republican co-sponsors and 27 Democratic co-sponsors. It is a very good step forward. But it is Donald Trump who made the cruel decision to terminate the DACA program last September in order to appease his anti-immigrant base. And the fact that he is now demanding that we cut our legal family unification system in half in order to protect dreamers reveals that his true goal is to end overall immigration as we know it. So now is the time for us to raise our voices uh, for our dreamers and to keep family reunification. There are so many actions that we need to do. Now, remember that uh, the next time that our um, uh, concurrent resolution or, or our budget deal ends is February 8th. So this is a very critical two weeks. So one thing I want to tell you is that I am reintroducing the Reuniting Families Act, and that is the family uh, that that is the bill that that reduces our current family immigration visa backlogs and promote humane and timely family reunification. We currently have 29 original co-sponsors of this bill, and I hope that uh, you can help us get getting even more um, members of Congress to support this bill. But I am going to be introducing this shortly. The other thing that we have to do is many actions to make sure that uh, Capitol Hill knows that we must keep our family uh, reunification system. And that means calling the senators, especially the senators, also calling our House members. Um, we need to also dispel stereotypes because there, there are people out there that think that in our family reunification system, you can actually petition for grandparents and cousins and aunts and uncles. You can, actually cannot do that at all. But there are a lot of stereotypes out there. We need rallies. We need we need for the public to know that we care about our family reunification system. Uh, we need op-eds uh, so that we can influence the media in terms of what it says about family reunification system. So we need our Asian Pacific Islander community to mobilize on many actions that will ensure that we keep the family reunification system that has made America strong. So thank you so very much for being on this call. Thank you, Representative Pugh. I'm going to hand it over to Angie Kim with Nagasek. Hi, thanks, Megan. Um, hi, everyone. I also want to thank uh, Congresswoman Judy Chu for being the not only the first Chinese American woman in the Congress, but um, I couldn't agree with uh, with more uh, on uh, most of your um, you know points and and, and uh, argument on not just the um, a solution for dreamers, but also for the entire 11 million undocumented um, community. So just a little background. Um, of, of myself, um, I am also what we call a dreamer or a young undocumented adult. Um, I came to the country when I was nine years old. I'm currently 34. 
Um, so I've experienced quite a bit in the tw last 25 years, and I, I also identify myself uh, in in with different different titles. Um, so I wanted to reflect a little bit on um, you know the the recent policy landscapes and some of the strategies that myself and and my colleagues and fellow dreamers have been um, championing. Um, you know, and working so hard in the last 12 months um, and some of the actions that took place. Um, so um, in reference to the White House memo um, and and their, you know, essentially Trump's proposal on a, a solution for the DACA recipients who will be losing their status and who are currently losing their status, um, and some of the broader pieces that he mentioned on the current immigration system. Um, we completely agree with Congresswoman Judy Chu on the fact that, um, you know, President Trump has obviously have took, you know, very conflicting positions often. Um, and oftentimes he cont contradicted himself. And, you know, as we all know, he's the one who took away the DACA. And it seems like maybe the his proposal might seem like a um, an attractive uh, What's piece not just because it does provide a pathway to citizenship for DACA recipients. However, um, it does throw a lot of most of the rest of the undocumented communities under the bus. Um, the amount of money that he's asking for for border border security. Uh, for a wall, um, we fear that um, those uh, resources will be used to for a mass deportation, mass arrest, um, who are essentially, they're our family, they're families of dreamers. So it, it I think it's, it's very, it's a disguised um, solution that seems like it's, you know, it gives a, it's a solution, but it's really not. Um, because if, if it's providing a pathway for just, a, you know, slightly over a million people um, and puts the rest of the communities, about like six million or so, in danger of deportation, that to us is not a solution as, as dreamers and as, as young people. Um, and the other piece I also want to highlight is that, um, you know, there's been a lot of conversations about a new proposal on an immigration system that works for the country, which I think they're phrasing as a merit-based system. Now, no one, we don't really know the specifics of this, but um, as, you know, the only Asian American dreamer and a woman on this panel, um, I also want to highlight that um, a merit-based system, I think in the long haul, can also, it, it's, it's a discriminatory policy um, because you know a lot of the women whether you're you're an immigrant who's in the country or or uh, future immigrants will be migrating to the country um, lack access to opportunities um, equality and ed they also experience education barriers so I also want to point out um, that fact um, so the White House deal is not a feasible one. It's very unrealistic, um, and we don't see it as a as a possible solution. Um, uh, I also want to point out uh, that I think you know uh, Congresswoman mentioned about uh, the sense of urgency that's so necessary right now, and that's so true. And we agree with that as well. So it's really time to put the line in the sand right now. Um, and we do agree that we need a solution um, because we have DACA recipients who are losing their status every day. However, um, the truth of the matter is that DREAM Act or Solution for Dreamers really was supposed to be part of a larger comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, and these two sort of factors are being pitted against each other. Um, and a lot of the bills carry um, you know, a compromise. And we don't see that being a, a feasible solution. So we are looking for a clean DREAM Act uh, that will provide a solution and protection for dreamers. Uh, but we also have another battle to fight, which is 
uh, to pursue a comprehensive immigration reform for the rest of the community. But we should not be pitting these two factors against each other to, for a quick solution. Um, so we, this, we see this as a longer journey, longer haul, longer fight. Um, and we don't want to compromise our families in exchange for a solution a quick solution for the dreamers. Um, so those are some of the reflection that I just wanted to speak in, you know, hopefully I'm not speaking for the entire population of dreamers, but some of the, uh, you know, points that I've experienced. And I also want to thank uh, Congresswoman Jayapal for your courage and, and leadership and for also boycotting uh, the State of Union address tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is this is Pramila Jayapal. Should I go ahead now? Please, I can hear you. Wonderful. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for that, and uh, I'm really excited actually to be with a group of apparently there are a thousand RSVPs for the event tonight. Um, activists and dreamers and women from across the country and to me that seems like a much better use of my time um, so I want to thank you for you know kind of the very clear statement that you just gave because I do think that we are I, I fear that we are in a sort of vortex that's taking us downward as the conversations get wider and wider um, in terms of what they want, but not in terms of what we want. And so we're not expanding the list of things that we're getting. We're just, um, you know, continuing to add all kinds of negative pieces to their side. And so to me, one of the most effective ways to combat that is actually by having immigrant rights and dreamer organizations be clear that that is not acceptable. Because I do think that there's you know, there is this sense that, well, this is an emergency, which it is. And I, I think it's horrendous that they're keeping, you know, they're, they're, they're taking dreamers hostage and the ransom is essentially the family-based immigration system and ending legal immigration as we know it. And I think that the, the power of dreamers in particular saying, we are not going to, um, we don't want to make that compromise and I don't know if everybody is where you are, but I think that that is an important and powerful um, tool for us, particularly if it's unequivocal, you know, if, if there's no sort of um, wavering on that. And I, I think, you know, I had a conversation yesterday with, with my senators, one of my senators, and I'll tell you that I think that the real problem we have is that, you know, whatever the Senate might agree to, and, and you can make a lot of arguments for, you know, why the Senate, you know, might have some leverage and this and that. But the problem is, whatever they agree to, there is no agreement for that in the House. And Ryan has continued to be controlled by uh, his Freedom Caucus and Bob Goodlatte. And and so we know that in any immigration bill that comes over here that isn't narrow is just going to get worse. And so, you know, that I think is a huge challenge. There have been some conversations about how do you get more Republicans, more of the centrist Republicans in the House on board? Should you include, you know, pieces of ag jobs? But, and I don't know, you know, my concern with that is we're giving away everything that we could use um, that, that say, for example, that business wants, if, if there's an H-1B or an egg jobs piece to this, giving away all of that without um, addressing the 11 million who are here and, and at the same time, including pieces of the family-based immigration system that would not be acceptable to us. So I don't see, um, you know, my, my belief is that we're best off if we keep this as narrow as possible and, you know, Herd Aguilar um, is still, I think, in the House, the bill that we should be trying to push for. But the problem is the leadership in the House is not pushing for that bill, right? They're trying to answer to the anti-immigrant faction of their caucus 
Um, and, you know, I think it's a very, very difficult dynamic because now um, that the Senate caved on, um, I, I shouldn't say it that way, but now that the Senate decided to go ahead and, and endorse the, the continuing resolution, um, I think it makes it hard to utilize that. I do think the defense caps are another place um, that where the Republicans really want to do something. And, you know, how do we tie this into that? So, you know, I, I think this is a tough spot that we're in. I do think that it's very important for dreamers to um, to be as clear as you were. And I, I don't know if we have unanimity on that position but i think that um i think that otherwise it is starting to you know it's sort of starting to be whatever donald trump wants donald trump will get because they just keep insisting on the same things and and we appear to just continue to to give now recognizing they're in the majority and that's the dynamic that's going on right now um, I think our our task is to tell the story, to continue to organize around those moderate Republicans, um, and to be very clear about what we won't accept. Thank you, Representative Jayapal. Um, we do have a, a couple other um, DACA recipients who plan to speak, but if um, any of the DACA recipients want to ask Representative Jayapal a question first um, while we have her? Go ahead. Hi, yeah. Um, yes, hi. Um, my name is Tony Choi, and I'm with an organization called 18millionrising.org. I'm also a DACA recipient. Uh, Representative Jayapal, what will be the best way forward to really push um, uh, the message on to uh, Speaker Ryan and uh, Leader McCarty to really, um, uh, you know, get get them on board with an actual solution instead of this delusional uh, pathway that White House is pushing. Well, I think that it's, um, you know, it, it is really getting more members of their caucus because they're not going to listen to anybody except the members of their caucus. And right now, the loudest voices, the ones they feel they have to listen to, are the Freedom Caucus anti-immigrant folks. So Ryan has said he's not going to put anything on the table. And so I think, you know, turning up the pressure on Republicans to um, to support a narrow version, to support the Herda Aguilar bill, I think is the best. But at least to say to them, look, you know, the minute this starts to go out into other areas, you, you lose Democrats. And don't forget that you will be blamed because you could not get a deal done. And so um, they do care about DACA recipients. They have, DACA, you know, DACA recipients are in every district, as you well know. And so I think turning up the heat on that on them is the way to get to McCarthy and Ryan. I also think, you know, a public campaign that says, why are you deserting dreamers? Um, you promised, you know, you lied, you're deserting dreamers. I don't know what the campaign is, but I do think some sort of a very public campaign targeted at Paul Ryan um, is also uh, uh, not a bad idea. But really, in terms of pressure, it's those Republicans in the caucus that he's going to need to give him cover if he brings this up. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Tony. Um, if other people have questions, I know some of you, we have to manually unmute you. You can raise your hand or you can chat the question in the chat box and I can read it. It looks like Myron Pawn has a question, so I'm gonna um, unmute you. Myron, are you there? Wait, I don't know if I did it right, hold on. <laughs> oh, he, he is self-muted. So Myron, if maybe you didn't um, raise your hand on purpose, but if you have a question, you could chat it in the chat box. Anybody else have any questions for Representative Jayapal? Hi, um, uh, I do, it's Angie again. Um, so um, Congressman Jayapal, so we very, so as an API dreamer, uh, you know, and members of the community, um, we consider this a family reunification uh, narrative very much an API issue. Um, as you know, we don't have a border, uh, a land border to cross. A lot of us are, are, are uh, visa overstays. Um, 
So do you think that we can count on KPAC um, to really hold the line and take on this issue within the Congress um, to, as you said, that um, that we are not going to like be pulled down on this vortex of of a deal that um, essentially should should have been two separate issues, and we really want to change that narrative in in making sure that people don't our own people in our communities don't fall into the trap of uh, of a sort of a, a quick solution um, for the young people um, for an exchange for policy that could potentially affect our communities um, moving forward for a really long time. So we're really looking for a leadership from KPAC to hold that ground and maintain that narrative and making sure that people don't sort of diluted or 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 be sort of succumb to um a, a deal of some sort well thank you for the question and we are absolutely doing everything we can congresswoman chu and i and meng and takano and others you know are speaking up at every opportunity and particularly judy and i are pushing our way into meetings that we are not invited to and you know I wrote a, uh, an op-ed piece you might have seen in The Nation on the family-based immigration system. You know, we've been pushing back against calling it chain migration. I mean, Democrats were calling it chain migration. And so it's really opened our eyes to, and I, I feel like I've known this for a long time because on the outside, it took us forever to get family reunification onto the agenda of comprehensive immigration reform. But it is still the least understood, even within our own caucus. And so we will hold the line as much as we possibly can, but what we need is for everybody on the phone to contact your Democratic representatives. Make sure that they understand what the family-based immigration system is. Contact leadership. Make sure people understand that this is pitting one community against another, that the family immigration system is critical for the AAPI community and for you know women across the country, women immigrants, and really try to um, explain what the family-based immigration system is and why it's so important and why it's such a critical issue for the API community. Because I think there are a lot of Democratic representatives, including members of the Hispanic Caucus that also represent large populations of um, Asian API immigrants who don't understand this. And the narrative is well, you know, we're just getting rid of categories that don't really do anything anyway. We're so backlogged that it won't really matter if we give up these. But there's two problems with that analysis, and this is what I've been trying to tell my colleagues. Number one, um, the minute you put family immigration on the table, it does not end with those categories that they're talking about. You know, the, you've already seen they want to get rid of the entire family-based system. They want to limit all of the categories and they want to end legal immigration as we know it. So it makes it much, much harder for us to argue that we should not be touching the family immigration system if it's already been touched. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is the categories themselves. When we held our noses, because I was on the outside at the time, held our noses in 2013 and said that we would support that comprehensive immigration reform deal even though it gave up the sibling category, which some of you might remember, we worked with Maisie Hirono to get that amendment, it failed. Um, we tried very hard to do everything we could to keep it. But in the end, we got a complete elimination of the family backlog. And so, you know, that was 4.7 million people, a majority of whom were AAPI. And so we got something big for that category. If we give it all away now, um, we're not going to have anything left, and there's certainly no positive movement in the direction of um, resolving the backlog issues or any of those things that we want from the family system. And their complete intent is to cut down all the legal family categories and move to a points-based system and not give points for the things that, you know, that, that really matter, right? Relationships and family relationships and the kinds of skills that are not marked in a tech job or something like that, but are part of taking care of family and, and uh, or being a domestic worker or many of the other issues. And so uh, those are the things that we need to make sure that democratic leadership and representatives understand. 
And I think you should, I want to make sure people don't assume that all the Democrats are on board with this. And that's true in the Senate and the House. I think there's a lot of lack of understanding or full knowledge of, of how the family-based system works and why it's so important. And even the fact that, um, you know, 82% of AAPIs got their status through the family-based immigration system. So we really need the outside voice to be very loud because we are, our voices are, we are pushing hard to make sure they're part of the picture. And I think we're doing the best job we can, but we have some challenges ourselves and we need your help. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Me. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Jayapal. And um, I don't know if you have to jump off or if you can stay on. We have two more um, DACA recipients who are going to speak. Our, um, next will be RJ Ronquillo with uh, Uplift. Hi, can you can you all hear me? Yep, thanks, RJ. Hi. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is RJ. I am a member of Uplift, an undocumented youth led API organization based in Los Angeles. I was a DACA recipient. Uh, my DACA has expired right now. Um, so back in December of last year, I was fortunate to go to DC. Um, it was nice to get to meet everyone from the API organizing rights table and the Undocu Black Network. It was also uplifting um, to hear that our ad advocacy efforts had led to several members of Congress to change their position on the CR. Um, even though it was nice to see a three-day weekend shutdown, um, it was still uplifting that there was results that came out of that. But then coming back here in California and seeing um, news about um, ICE targeting cities in California like San Francisco, seeing the White House proposal on immigration, I can't help but see its resemblance from how it was back then. Um, I feel like I'm watching the same, the same movie, but with a Hollywood remake. Sure, we have different players now, things have changed, but the narrative is still the same. It's still being... It's immigrants being pitted against one another in a battle to see who is more deserving and who is not. The threat of the deportation, it looms large in our family and our family's lives. I mean, back in 2010, um, we saw President Obama deport two, more than 2 million immigrants, which some of them whom I personally know. And now in 2018, we have a president that aspires to match those numbers by using the same de deportation apparatus that was built by his predecessor. The White House proposal is a slap in the face to our immigrant communities because it is asking us, those who would benefit from it, those who would be able to thrive from, from getting those legislation to sell out our community members by being complicit in their criminalization and in their oppression. So throwing our community members under the bus is not how we won when we got DACA in 2012. It was through our collective mobilization as community that led to its announcement. I am reflecting on this because I feel that we are re replicating the strategies that led to the failure of the DREAM Act in 2010, rather than replicating the strategies that led to the signing of DACA. It was the mobilization of the undocumented community that gave us DACA. And that is why it is important that our strategies center directly impacted folks, meaning that it is us, the undocumented, that dictates what we can and can't do politically. And it, it is us that should command our political realities. It should not be the other way around. It should not be the White House telling us what to do and what we can do. It should not be the Freedom House caucus telling us, dictating us that this is the deal that we're giving you and this is the deal that you have to take. I think we have to take back that narrative. As a community, we should stand together and not against one another. Furthermore, we also must see that DACA and the DREAM Act, as my colleagues have mentioned before, it is not the end goal, but rather a, a step or a temporary fix in the right direction. We understood that this is not the end, but rather the beginning of a movement that aims to protect all immigrants, not just a few. I think these are the strategies that we have to employ right now. A strategy, a strategy that keeps asking us to choose between papers over our community members is not a sustainable strategy. Having to choose between our status over the criminalization of our parents has created a lot of stress and anxiety among us. And has actually impacted our health and wellness. A good strategy entails the understanding of what our ultimate goal is. And for me, that means seeing the Clean Dream Act as part of a short-term strategy in achieving our long-term our long goal, which is the protection of all immigrants, including our parents, 
family members, friends, and neighbors. This means that any deal that requires us to backtrack on this commitment, like what the White House has proposed, should not should be taken off the table and should not be considered at all. Because personally speaking, the, the onus is on us to advocate for what is best for our community. Because it is only us together that we can rely on each other. And speaking personally, I don't think I will be complicit in propagating the racist, misogynistic, and homophobic agenda of this administration. And I hope that everyone on this call won't do that too. Thank you. Thank you so much, RJ. I I think that Representative Chu is back on, and we do have an, one more question that I can direct to her. Representative Chu, can you can you hear us? Are you on? Did she be unmuted? Where'd she go? Do you know? I don't hear her. We don't hear you. What? It worked before. Okay, well, maybe <laughs> she's not on or we're having technical difficulties. So um, I'm going to hand it over to our next speaker, who is um, Jungwoo Kim with Nakasek. Jungwoo, can, can you talk so we can make sure we can hear you? Sure. Hi. Can you guys hear me? Hello. Yeah. That's good. Hey, uh, my name is Jungwoo, and uh, I'm a documented um, and also uh, undocumented. Um, First of all, thanks for having me on this call, and thank you, Congresswoman Jaya Paul, and to for showing strong leadership for community. So um, I'll express my express my honest feelings and what our young people feel about the current situation. Actually, first of all, we're so disappointing, and when the government reopened with our clean bill pass, we felt like being used as bargaining chip by Congress members, um, and, and and also when the, the White House, the Trump they propose uh, their agenda for immigration, um, build a wall, cut a family sponsorship program, diversity visa. I felt like this is a water, it's so poisonous, we cannot drink it. If you drink it, it will, it will kill me, it will kill my family, it will kill my um, community members. So, I mean, don't get me wrong, this is third time as, uh, uh, for me to fight for the clean bill. Um, I'm 34 years old. This third time for, I'll fight for the bill. Anything that I, they can provide me uh, permanent protection so I can stay, live here, peace of mind. But as you know, if it's not clean bill, it's not worth to fight for. So we've been fighting for at least for six months for clean bill. So we're asking our S our S so simple and straightforward to shaping members. If it's not clean bill or any bill that will hurt me or our family members or Congress uh, um, community members, please do not vote on it. And, and let's keep fight for the clean bill. And and because our young people are not the politicians, so we we don't have any control on any vote. But we, we have to rely on your leadership, rely on your vote. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jungwoo. Um, I'm going to hand it over to John Yang, President and Executive Director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC, to wrap us up, and then we'll take questions. Right. Thank you, Megan. And I think uh, thank you to all of the DREAMers, the DACA recipients that spoke. I think your words are very, very inspiring. Obviously, thank you very, very much to Representative Chu and Representative Jayapal for their leadership in Congress. I, as I listen to this, I, I think one, a few things that I want to emphasize for people on this call. Obviously, here we are, if you will, speaking to the choir. These are You guys are all people that already sort of agree with what we are doing, what all of us are trying to get accomplished. So let me offer a couple of thoughts in terms of what we really should be doing. Uh, number one is, as Representative Jayapal said, is really sort of follow up with them leadership as well as Republicans. You know, making sure the Democrats, especially in, in the Senate as well as the House, you know, people like Leader Pelosi, uh, the uh, Minority Whip Hoyer, on the uh, Senate side, it would be Senator Durbin and uh, Senator Schumer. 
make sure they understand the importance of the family unification piece, that they understand that that should not be on the trading block and that there should be no cuts to family in any sort of immigration deal, that it has to be a clean dream deal. Because I think it's important that the Dems hear that from all of us. Our KPAC members are going to do whatever they can to push back on it, but unless all of us speak up to them directly, uh, they will ha be, be limited in what they will be able to accomplish. Part of that, frankly, is making sure that our KPAC members are at the bargaining table. That hasn't always happened in the past, so we want to make sure that uh, the Dems hear that. Number two is story collection. I think you know a number of our organizations, Asian Americans Advancing Justice, as well as NACASAC, uh, OCA, CRAC, we're all trying to gather stories about how family has benefited us, how dreamers have benefited this country. And telling that story, humanizing that story is so important to you know, uh, that, that narrative shift that we are trying to make. And the fact that there are going to be so many dreamers at the State of the Union address tonight speaks, you know, speaks in a way that some of the statistics that all of us have don't, which is it humanizes us. So I encourage people to do that. The last piece I would say is, as Representative Chu noted, she is going to be reintroducing the Reunited, Reuniting Families Act, and she are looking for co-sponsors from other members of Congress. I would encourage all of you in sort of reaching out to the members of Congress to encourage them to sign on to that, because that at least gives us a, a, a marker and a place to say what we want in sort of uh, in the family immigration system, and not simply be responding to or saying no to uh, what other people are presenting, you know, specifically the administration, Senators Cotton and Purdue, and, and um, Representative Goodlock. So I think those are three concrete things, obviously, any op-eds, any, any other stories that people can tell, we got to do it now. There's an urgency of now. I've been saying to people, don't let perfection be the enemy of good. We need to get out there now. Thank you very, very much. Thanks, John. Um, we can take questions. I think the members of Congress had to jump off, but um, the rest of our speakers are here. So you can chat your questions or you can raise your hand to see if we can unmute you, though. I'm a little tech technologically challenged. Um, I, ha I have some questions, so let me just take a se second to look at them. Um, Vincent Wong just made, has a comment that AAPI communities are planning to hold demonstrations and rallies in California, New York, and Ohio to show support. Um, Isabella Lesna has a question. What does the timeline look for passing Clean Dream Act and protecting family immigration now that the funding deadline is out of the way for now? Will there be intense negotiations for the next funding deadline? Does someone want to take that question? And other people could uh, other people could add in as, as appropriate. You know, one first fight is probably going to be the week of February eighth, leading up to the you know the the current continuing resolution for spending ends on February eighth. Although I think everyone recognizes that there's probably not going to be another shutdown. Uh, at least Leader McConnell in the Senate intimated that you know they would try to do something in the run up to that unclear what that might look like but there may be some bill that is introduced in the senate and probably that would result in a lot of different amendments being offered and so that's one place that we're going to need to speak loudly uh, to make sure that nothing and i'm going to speak, unfortunately say it in the negative make sure that nothing bad happens i mean i think as representative jai paul suggested even if the Senate were to pass something, the chances of it going somewhere in the House seem remote, but the concern is that the Senate, especially the Democrats, might give away too much, and then it makes it a hard, harder bargaining position the next time around. I mean, after that, I think it's the March 5th date, um, and so we'll just have to see sort of after February 8th what that environment looks like. Thanks, John. I have a couple questions about AAPI data, um, undocumented data. I think Rep. Jaya Paul mentioned a number. Um, there is AAPIdata.com is a really good source for AAPI data, and they have all kinds of statistics um, 
about AAPIs at the congressional district level, at the state level, and they do have one, I think, um, data source on undocumented AAPIs. But our um, at the end, we're, we're going to list our emails. So this is Megan Asahab, and you can email me if you have specific data questions and I can try to find the answers um, for you. And um, Bessie's going to send a follow-up email with information about story collection, and she can also put the aapidata.com website. Um, and I'm, now I'm just looking for other questions. Okay, so Young Woon um, Han from Nakasek says, I'd like to ask, what do you guys see as our strategy to get the DREAM Act passed at this point? Angie, do you have thoughts? Uh, yeah, so um, again, I, I don't like uh, being, uh, you know, speaking on behalf of of a very intelligent uh, community, and I'm going to assume that I'm not. But my thoughts on passing the Dream Act, um, uh, I think we do have a momentum right now, considering um, considering um, you know a big part of that population are DACA recipients, and we are obviously the program has been rescinded. So I kind of see the the strategy really uh, being the the role of uh, what we call dreamers, right? I think um, also in order to make sure that the narrative around a clean dream act excludes any other policies, I like to call them like the Republican version of a CIR that they're trying to push in exchange for some protection for the dreamers. Um, I think in order to eliminate that narrative, and really create like a standalone bill is for the dreamers to really step up and and push um, that sense of urgency. Obviously, we've been I think we've been doing a really good job on um, making sure that when we speak about the Dream Act and the need for protection for the dreamers, that we also highlight that we're not willing to compromise our families. Um, but I, I think um, if the dreamers really take on the on the, the the championship role as we have already, um, I think it might help to um, to kind of narrow down, like Congresswoman Jayapal said, the narrative uh, and keep it clean. Um, so I really see just you know, um, I honestly think that the our um, actions in the past, you know, through what how many CRs that we've seen so far. Um, at least my experience when I was in DC, I mean, I've seen some amazing actions, amazing advocacy and organizing work done by dreamers. Um, so I have no complaint there. I think it's just keeping that momentum going, um, keeping each other, giving each other support, making sure that we are good as a community, that we're taking care of ourselves, that uh, we don't fall into the trap and, 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 and uh, narrative around this being, um, that uh, that we are willing to settle for a quick solution. Um, so I see this as, you know, a long battle, like I said, um, but the messaging is that we need to pass the Clean Dream Act now. Um, so that's sort of my two cents on the strategy around. Um, so, you know, the keeping the legislative visits, keeping pressure on both parties, um, keep sharing our stories, um, highlighting, you know, uh, what our future would look like without a relief, without a future, without a pathway to citizenship. Thank you, Angie. Anybody else have anything to add to that? Hi, this is RJ. I just want to add um, to what um, Angie was was saying and agreeing that we we need to keep the pressure and we need to figure out who actually our allies will be and who are not allies that was that would just be there just just because this is the issue but actually there because they understand what because they truly understand what our communities are going through and i think for us to also push the narrative and not just necessarily maintain the dreamer narrative 
but actually be be understanding on how we share our stories and how we share our stories about pushing the dreamer narrative that it's not just about the dreamers but it's also about our families our family immigration and how that is important to us um and i think that's why we need to keep resisting anything that would that would um make it that would make the dreamer narrative something that is the only thing that's happening but actually to push a narrative that is inclusive of all and i think that's one of the biggest strategy that we can do because when when the undocumented movement first started going on it was about pushing pushing a narrative that people don't think that was that's something that they don't like but they keep pushing pushing and now we have a dreamer narrative but now we need to keep pushing that more so that we can be inclusive of all and not just certain certain individuals that would benefit from it. So I think it's about pushing the narrative further than what we have right now. It's also one of the strategies that we can use um, to make sure that it's inclusive for all. Thank you so much, um, RJ. We, um, I'm just gonna read a comment here. Um, Sun Kwan from Korean American Grassroots Conference says that They've been mobilizing their college students to host foam bakes to call members of Congress for urgent passage of a Clean Dream Act for the last two weeks, and also just says thank you, everyone, and the speakers on the call, and Representative Chu and Chaya Bahal for the leadership and insight. So thank you, Sunquan, for participating. Um, another comment we had was about sending the action items out. So Bessie will send a follow-up email to everyone who participated um, with all of the action items um, that were mentioned in terms of we have script for calling members of congress information about the reuniting families act and asking for sponsorship and um, help needed with uh, story collection are there any other questions Okay, well, um, we have a couple minutes, so if any of our speakers have any final remarks they want to make, you can go ahead now, or otherwise we can end. Oh, and I've been asked to mention um, that tonight for the State of the Union, um, we're using the hashtags um, value our families and no family van, van um, to defend our family immigration system. And so when the president surely mentions the fact that he wants to cut family immigration or uses the term chain migration, um, we'll be responding. And we encourage folks on social media to also um, respond and use those hashtags. Oh, I got another question. Are there key senators, states, or representatives that we should focus our efforts on? Does anyone, anyone want to take that? Uh, Megan, you're actually, this is John from AJC. You're, Megan, you're probably the best one to answer that. I've, yeah, I, in the short term, like on the Senate side, I actually do think that making sure that our Senate Democrats stay strong is important. So again, it is Senator Schumer, Senator Durbin, uh, and, and if you think about some of the other senators that are sort of potentially red states, you know, even like Senator Feinstein's generally been good, but you know, sort of reinforcing to her how important dreamers are, how important the family unification is, is definitely critical. Um, then if you're sort of looking at some of the more borderline Republicans, everyone talks about Senator Graham, but, you know, I think I heard mobilization in Ohio, Senator Portman's an excellent target. Because he said favorable things about dreamers, but you know we have yet to see real action from that side. Um, and we can also think about sort of other borderline states. Senator Heller from Nevada comes to mind because he has a huge Asian American and immigrant population. Likewise, Texas Senator Cornyn has a large immigrant population, but has largely stood on the side of uh, nativists and restrictionists when it comes to immigration. So those are some, some quick thoughts on, on the Senate side, and if you sort of map it out on the house side it would be the same sort of the some of the collar counties outside of la that tre that have conserved typically been republican held but are trending away 
uh, you know, you might want to think about the same thing in New York or New Jersey or Pennsylvania. Uh, yeah, this is a, uh, Go ahead. Oh yeah, this is Tony Choi, and I would like to add that you know that we must keep on pushing, you know, like our Democratic members in in, in the House as well. You know, uh, recently, um, uh, um, uh, Representative Gottheimer came out with the uh, with the principles for a bill that he is um, uh, coming up with the Problem Solvers Caucus, and you know, we we've seen that you know it's very exclusive uh, to uh, towards our family. So you know, we all we need you know we need to be uh, you know like making making sure that we hold whomever's at the table accountable, that they stand up for our families as well, because our families deserve a chance to be, you know, like, uh, deserve a chance as well. And, and um, yeah, and we, we and, you know, like, and we must keep on focusing, you know, like where the um, API community is. I mean, I think um, uh, John brought up a great uh, point about New Jersey, especially, well, with some uh, two Republicans who are retiring in New Jersey, um, you know, we, we must, you know, like, it, it, I think it's a critical junction that, you know, we have the momentum and we have the power to really, uh, you know, affect change uh, in, in the state. Thanks, Tony. And I'll just give a plug for the AAPI Immigrant Rights Organizing Table. Um, if you're not um, on our email list or plugged into our calls, you can email me and, and we welcome more folks to join where we have sort of more tracking and can have deeper conversations about targets. Um, the more the merrier. And with that, I think we're at an hour. Um, thank you again so much to our speakers and for everybody for joining the call. And we, we look forward to talking to you more in the future.